I um, co-direct a studio called Studio Bollin. Uh, we're based in Musenberg in Cape Town. We've got some of our amazing staff in the stream. Uh, Minnie Bust, uh, she's, uh, her name's Princess. She's here. We've got Jason. We've got Garth. Uh, we've got Tr Tracy Toreshi down at the bottom. Um, yeah, it's great to have everyone here. And, and thanks so much for, for joining. Um, all right, uh, maybe Jeannie, do you want to introduce yourself and kind of tell us a little bit about who you are? I don't know if that's included in your class, but huh? maybe as a way of introduction, I'll hand things over to you. But yeah, I, I will gladly introduce myself. So my name is Jeannie. Uh, I've been a storyboard artist since 2016, and I initially started with a Canadian studio called Chocolate Moose Media. And I worked on about 30 productions with them. So I basically learned about storyboarding trial by fire. And we were creating a really tight turnaround, short animations for the, the United Nations to address issues um, in different communities. Uh, from there, I started expanding into different South African companies. I had the opportunity to work on projects like Sam the Hedgehog. I was one of the main storyboarders on that project initially. Um, I then worked with a number of like local advertising agencies um, and some of our larger studios. And then eventually I went on to go and work with a studio called Sir Lancelot in Sweden. And I was part of the advertising team for Lego Ninjango and um, what do you call it? The Lego Movie 2. Um, so that was a lot of fun. And that sort of led me into what I now do, which is teaching. Um, and I found that I really, really find that enjoyable. So combining storyboard and teaching is like the best thing ever for me. So I really hope you guys get a lot out of tonight's session. Um, if you do have questions, please stop me. This is a very, very dense le uh, lecture. So um, I will make this presentation available to you guys afterwards. Um, some of those that have trained enemies, Talila, I see you in chat there. I see Kel, you guys, uh, they're actually interns of mine at the studio where I work. So for them, this will be a revision. Hopefully for a lot of you, this will be new. Um, so yeah, I do talk fast. Do slow me down if you feel like I'm like rushing ahead of things. And uh, make sure that you've got some questions to ask. We can end off the session if we have enough time with a short little demo where we can do a prompt and just see what we come up with. Um, but for now, what I'm going to be mainly focusing on is storyboards, what they're used for, how to create them, and very basic things to avoid. Okay, I'm going to turn off my camera, and let's get started. Can you guys see my screen? Yeah, yeah, we can see it. It's, it's all good. It's coming through perfectly. Okay, cool. So, we've got five sections. Um, we're probably going to skip context, because that's just about, about the history of storyboarding. Um, and while that is interesting, I feel like for the sake of time, let's just give a little bit of a, you know, scoot along. Uh, we can come back to it if we do have enough time. Um, and then we're just going to look at the process, what makes a good storyboard, some very useful rules to help you guide and figure things out, and common mistakes and how to avoid them. And then I've just included a few little uh, useful links at the end. Do, do, do. Okay, cool. I think the... the last one there is important. So storyboards have a function and they're a valuable tool to any production. So a main function of a storyboard is actually a money-saving tool and a planning document. A storyboard acts as your blueprint for the entire production and what they do is they help you identify problems in the production before they even happen because uh, a lot of things in writing look really good until you actually get it on screen. They also help you identify the most cost-efficient way of appealing um, or appealing ways to handle your scenes. They help keep the crew informed at every step of the way because obviously if you're having a larger production, you can have many people coming in and out of the process and the storyboard will make sure that everyone stays aligned. It also serves as a means to track your progress. So um, often when you have a production schedule, they'll be using the storyboard to inform that entire production schedule. And then obviously to serve as a guide or manual that ensures that stress and conflict is minimalized. You know, you don't want people to say, oh, the shot's supposed to work this way. No, it's supposed to work this way. Just go refer to the storyboard. It helps. Um, and this is because boards are pitched multiple times. And this gives the crew the opportunity to give their own input and ideas to the story as well. Okay. So let's just have a look. What is the process of creating a storyboard? So it starts with a reading. 
Um, and when I say read, I mean read, 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 read. It's a very tedious process, but it is rewarding. Uh, if you're actually going to make uh, any sort of progress with storyboards, I highly recommend that you learn some of the following steps to ensure you get off to the right start. So always start by reading your script. Do not ever rush into a project. Rather get yourself familiar and acquainted. So take your time, read. If, if your um, schedule allows, I would say a minimum of three days just to sit with the script and really get to know it. Make some notes, but at this point, avoid all drawing. The next thing you're going to do is research. And following that, you will do your beatboard. So we'll get into that a bit later. We also have thumbnailing, and then finally, you'll actually start the storyboarding process. And then after that, we can move into animatics, where we introduce sound, music, um, camera movements, and actually have the timing put out for us. Okay. So why is reading important? So as a storyboard artist, you need to know the story as intimately as the person who wrote it. You're in charge of bringing the writer and the director's vision to life, so you really need to know what they're looking for. The first step when receiving your script is just to read it. Not once, not twice, at least 10 times. So it takes a few days to mull the story over, write your ideas, ask the directors and writers questions, and then put it aside. The most incompetent mistake you could make is to not know or understand your brief, which is the script. So take your time with it, regardless of crazy deadlines. It's mandatory to need a day at least, ideally five days, to get to know the content before anything is drawn. Um, being on the same page as your writers and directors is not only good professionalism, but it makes your working experience really, really positive. Um, another thing about this whole process, and when I say get to know um, what the writers and directors are thinking, most of the time, especially if you're working in short films and films in general, the writers put incredibly personal scenes and ideas into the story. Um, so when you start spotting things, it's best to investigate with them because they could have their own, you know, imagining and idea for how something should be handled. You go the opposite direction, they're going to shoot you down. Um, so it's good to find that mid ground and you'll only know that if you think to ask uh, about that. So an example is uh, earlier this year, I was a revisionist on a short film and the short film centered around two brothers fighting and um, knowing the director, I thought, okay, let me investigate this because I know you're an only child. What is the story actually about? And it was actually about a falling out with a really close personal friend that has literally scarred him so deeply. It was as if he had lost his brother. Um, so it was good to know that context so that I could also adjust how the relationship dynamics work because there's a difference in how you treat your friend versus your brother. So um, having that you know, information really did help me amplify and... Um, really, you know, pin down those boards. Okay, so another thing. By the way, let me just ask real quick. Am I moving too fast? Is anyone lost yet? I think it's a, it's a good pace for me. I don't know if anyone else feels different, but it uh, okay. feels like a good pace. All right. If I do go too fast, guys, literally shout. Okay, I get excited and I talk a mile a minute. Okay, so what are you looking for when you're reading a script? So the first few times, just read the story and enjoy it. Once you've done this a few times, start having a look at, is the genre reading clear? Because genre, as you know, or I hope you know, genre conventions, each kind of genre has its own specific way of doing things, its own toolbox. If we look at a genre convention, for example, of horrors or thrillers, you will see a lot of Dutch tilts, canted views. Um, you'll see a teal and yellow color palette, very slow pacing. So these are all things that are iconic around um, those genres. So get an idea of what is the genre that you're working with and is it really coming through? See if there's a clear sense of flow to the story. Does it have a few dead spaces? Where can you start cutting things down? It's usually best to cut the story down as much as possible until it is literally the tightest possible timing hopefully by then under time, and then you actually have space to move around and explore. See if you can identify what kind of characters live in the story. Do they have archetypes? Um, are there any like things that you can pull out of this in terms of if there's a character that is extremely negative, could you maybe attach a motif to it or a certain camera style to this character? Um, are there specific epochs you need to research? And when I say an epoch, this is... Uh, referring specifically to the time that the story is taking place in. Is it 1900s? 
Is it, you know, 30,000 years in the future? What is your socio-political climate like? What is the general area like geographically? And, um, you know, what, what kind of um, economy are you in? So these are all things that will inform possibly the way you handle it. I saw a wonderful um, example just recently, um, and this played into Epoch, and it was a very subtle but very clever um, tool, was in the newest Top Gun, when we were intercutting from the character's current life to flashbacks, they actually switched over to a really old film style. So that film quality changed completely. And that's because they were using cameras from that actual epoch. Um, and it was really subtle, but it actually really pushed that idea of, you know, this aged idea in your head. Um, and that was really effective. So look out for things like that. So also see if you can notice part of the scripts that you can trim and cut out. Um, are you able to identify all the story key beats? Um, so what I mean by this is a story follows a structure. So it could be a linear or a non-linear story. It really depends on what you're going to do. It could even be a cyclical story, but it will still have a sense of structure to it. Um, mainly your simplest form of a story is a beginning, a middle, and an end. Um, but see if you can find what is called your uh, establishment. So where you get to know the character for the first time, your first uh, explosion or your first um, moment that pushes the character into action. What is their reaction to that? Um, then they, you know, you follow the escalating uh, conflict until you get to your climax, your um, rising conflict, and then finally you start to end the story off and then, you know, you get to fade out to the actual end of the story. So see if you can find those beats. It's okay if some of them are not yet like clearly defined, um, but it does help to have a good sense on where in the story you would need to put your emphasis. So also take note of how many locations and times of day changes there are, because you will be working as the storyboard artist. You... Yes? Oh. Uh, I think it was just a mistake. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right, no worries. Um, so as a storyboard artist, this document is not just something to look at, but it's something the rest of the crew is going to pull a lot of information from. So to make their lives easier, try to keep track of how many locations you've got, how many characters you've got, times of day, and this will really help your layout, a character, asset team, color scripting team, all of them figure out what they need because by the end of the storyboard, then they've got a list and that really does help move things along. Um, are there any specially noted phrases you can pick out that will have a visual influence? Um, sometimes you will get uh, writers or directors that put really flowery language into film, which is not very common. Usually we have very economical writing, meaning it's to the point, it says what it needs to say and it gets out. But sometimes you will notice that the director would say something like, she coyly looked up at him. But what is a coy look? Are we going to now need a lower angle to make her look innocent? You know, phrases like that might influence the way you treat the camera. Okay, and then can you clearly pick out the theme of the film? Is the theme around family? Is it around loss? Is it around love? Is it around grief? Um, there can be, you know, more than one theme, but what is your through line? What is the main thing that drives the story? And then lastly, how does this film resonate with you, the storyboard artist? It's very, very difficult sometimes to work on a project when you have no grasp whatsoever with the story. So rather than, um, you know, getting a little worked up, because you can burn out quite easily then, it's good to sit again with your directors and writers and really see if there's some part, even if it's a small little beat that you can look forward to working on that has something of a semblance of importance to you. It will make working on this project so much more um, enjoyable and you know, energizing. Okay, now we can move on to the next step before we get to our storyboarding, which is research. So what is it? So you've now clearly read through your story. You can begin to analyze your notes. Anything you're unsure about, research it. If you are still uncertain, though, here are a few basic things you can start off. So again, have a look at your epoch or the setting. So is this an actual place in reality? Are we somewhere in Africa with Toto? Or are we on planet Pandora in Avatar? You know, look into it from your character's point of view. If it is a fictional world, look into elements that could support that. So if it is something like Game of Thrones, maybe look into some of the older works that are similar in that nature that could work, you know, towards that, like um, 
Monty Python's Holy Grail if you're looking for a comedic aspect. If you're going for the big epic adventure, have a look at The Hobbit. You know, draw on what exists already and use that as a foundation to build upon. Look into the occupation of your characters as well, um, because this could influence perhaps how they behave on screen or how they, you know, end up being designed. Research the archetypes of the character of the story. So I'm not sure if you guys are aware of archetypes, but basically archetypes are genre for people. You get things like the hero, which is generally the center point of the story, and they're the one that has the call to action and goes on all these adventures. You have something like the stage, uh, the stage, the sage, um, and that would be, for example, Rafiki from um, The Lion King. You know, he's there to give wisdom and he's very mystical and he's only there when he needs to be. Um, you get things like the mother who is there to nurture and guide. Um, you get things like the, the faithful companion, you know, Sam from The Hobbit again. Um, these are all archetypes and they have very specific ways of behaving and it can really help inform your acting um, because there's so many like different topics as the border that you will have to touch on. So it's really good to know these things. Lastly, find films both you and the director agree are in the vein of what you want to do. So it's very hard to go into something completely blind when it, you know, the director will say, oh, you know, I really want some action and it needs to have horror in there and it needs to be set in the 1800s but with like a futuristic look. You know, what the hell does that mean? Rather see if you can find films that actually closely align or that the director enjoys because usually, again, people draw from what they enjoy um, and see if you can build on that. And this will also help you idea, uh, identify what's called a cinematic language. So um, this will give you a guide when constructing your own um, boards. So just to clarify what a cinematic language is, every film has one. And it is basically a selection of types of shots you would use to curate your film. So think of like a PowerPoint presentation. If you add too many fonts, it gets a bit mental. But if you have like two or three fonts that you stick with all the way through, you actually build what's a really nice appealing style. Same thing goes with how you treat your camera. Okay, now we can move on to beatboards. So uh, beatboards are the elevator pitches of the storyboarding world. As the name implies, you're literally just illustrating the key story beats. And think of this, uh, if you cannot say the pitch in an extremely simplified version of your story in a concise, easy to follow manner, you do not know your story. Um, you need to be able to really get that story downbeat within two minutes or less. Um, so the beat boards are like the visual representation of this. So pitching will, will let you and the crew know if the story is understandable um, and if you have absorbed the correct information um, and that it remains consistent. Typically, beat boards are a lot more detailed than a storyboard. They may even include color. So when I say detailed, I mean like the drawings are hyper rendered, um, almost as if it would be the final output. Maybe not to that degree, but there are certainly a lot more visual information in a beat board than in a storyboard. Also, um, the general rule for them is 15 or less boards. And this goes all across the board. If you're doing it for a feature or a 20 second short, 15 boards or less. If you have to use more boards than that, you're now cluttering the story. Because again, it's about story beats. And if you go by a normal story structure, generally you have 10 beats in a story. You might use a more Shakespearean kind of storytelling, which might have five acts, uh, at which point then you can add, you know, maybe four more beats to it. So 15 is a safe number. If you're having more than that, it means that something's gone awry here. So this goes for feature films, and if the story beats cannot be understood in 15 beats or left, you need to make modifications. And this will just save you so much time with your storyboarding um, and really helps you reiterate for yourself what you need to do. Okay, then you can come to the thumbnailing process. And this is actually probably one of the best parts of storyboards because this is where there's no commitment. You're just playing around with the story for a bit. Um, so thumbnails are the tiny drawings you do on physical script or on scraps of paper you have nearby. They get their name because they are literally supposed to be the size of your thumbnail. They're that tiny, low detail. You can see some little scribbles over here. That is the kind of detail we're looking for in thumbnails. So these are cursory ideas that will help you to gradually move from written word to a definitive visual. And the thumbnail is intended to be extremely loose, tiny image. Um, I don't know why it just cut out off there. 
but um, usually they have very, very minimal detail and they should, you know, it, it should be easy for you to crumple it up, throw it away and start over if you need to. Okay, so now we can move on to the sections of the storyboard or the elements of the storyboard. Um, I've, got, I've got a question um, yes. while, you, while you're breaking between the section. Yeah. Um, in the motion design kind of industry, a, a lot of us, we work on very short productions. Mm. So we sometimes will receive a script um, that is, you know, 30 seconds to a minute long and we'll be asked, okay, now it's your job to storyboard the script out. What is your kind of advice for super quick productions, like productions that from the script to the final renders, like three weeks, um, and you really only have a day or two. Um, do you have, like, like how, would, how would you advise a storyboard artist who really does not have a lot of time at all? I would say the best thing to do when you have very little time is give yourself a lot of rules. Uh, rules force you to stay on target and they force you to really um, consider and um, investigate your ideas. So, for example, I recently animated the Cape Town International Animation Festival's trailer and I gave myself, from the minute I received the offer to do it, I told myself 10 shots or less, no more than 50 seconds, um, and it's going to be about the wind and locations, and that's my rules. If I've gone over 10 shots, I need to cut it out. And I ended up, I think, with seven shots, so I worked well within it. I was on target for my time limit. That's generally the best thing to do. Um, I would say then as well, definitely get as much of the crew involved as possible to one, avoid too much back and forth, but it also allows you to draw as much advice from as many people as possible um, from you know their own p professional um, point of view. So in, in film, we have you know so many different teams and although the storyboard artist is supposed to be one of the stronger draftsmen, it's unfair to expect you to know everything. So the best way to cut corners is once you've got an idea, say, okay, cinematographer, what do you think of this idea? Okay, you think that won't work? Let's quickly swap it out with this. Keep to your thumbnails. And once those are working, you can scan them right in, time them out. And then from there, you've got a working little uh, storyboard. Let me know if that answers your question. Perfect. Thanks so much. Okay, cool. Perfect. Um, all right, so what makes up a storyboard? So often you'll see storyboard panels and they've got a lot of information in them. Um, so I've sort of broken it down here a little bit. So first you'll usually get a little square in the top left and this will give you your shot number. Top right, you'll often find a little F that stands for frame and this indicates the duration of your shot. It's really, 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 really important to find out what frame rate you're working at. Some people want to work at 25, some people want to work at 12, some want to work at 24. So if you say 96 frames and you're thinking we're working at 24, but no, we're actually working at 12 frames a second, it could have a really big impact on what the final edit looks and feels like pacing wise, because it could speed up or slow things down quite a lot. So make sure you know your frame rate. That's like first newbie number one. Okay. The next thing you'll notice is you've got your bounding box, and this is where the actual frame will be drawn in. And then sometimes you will find um, these sort of notes on here. So you'll have an A, and then it will move to a different square with arrows indicating. So this is telling you how the camera is going to move. You're going to see we start at camera A, we're going to like zoom in to camera B. Okay, so that is the note for the cinematographers. This bounding box gives the aspect ratio to whatever you're working on, you usually note it at the beginning of the storyboard. And then you'll have additional information uh, added in. So there's a number of software programs that allow you to actually just import the script itself, but it is quite possible that you would have to manually do it on paper from time to time. So it's good to know what needs to go in there. So usually you would make notes of if there's any sound, notes of any dialogue, if we need to see any special effects that either an effects artist, a motion designer, or a um, VFX artist needs to know about that would be there. And then you need to have a shot description. And I cannot stress this enough. A lot of the times people will draw a frame like what you see over there and leave the shot description out. And someone would think uh, maybe the dog's in like a really weird forest, you know, because it's black and white. No one knows what's actually going on there. 
So it's it's really important that you clarify for the team what is going on because visuals aren't always everything. And because we don't have motion to give us context, we need words to fill that void in. Okay, so this is my personal golden rule. This is what I found um, as I storyboarded uh, and got to really enjoy film. Um, something to consider to make it easier for you to understand cinematic language and to understand the psychology of film is always think of your camera as the character itself. So film is manipulation. Every element of film is designed to give um, with care to evoke certain thoughts and feelings from the audience. And our connection to the story is through the camera. So we need to give the camera a very particular manner in which to interact with our characters on screen. So when I say film is manipulation, sound design actually makes use of a hell of a lot of it. Uh, you get drones that, you know, the, the, the reverb happens in your stomach and that can make you feel anxious, which is why you will hear in horror films that that's exactly what that's doing to you. It's not just a noise to be like, oh, a loud noise. It actually has a physiological effect on you. Um, color does the same thing. When we see the color blue on screen, it conjures feelings of sadness, coldness, um, loneliness. Uh, the color red will make you feel either vibrant, angry, or, you know, some love interest going on there. There is language to every element of film. So, composition. When we think of our character, camera as the character, this will really help you form your composition a lot. And composition refers to how you choose to arrange what we see on screen. Film is its own language and it's a tool of manipulation. So how you choose to arrange elements or, or characters on screen will indicate a myriad of information to the viewer. So some common terms you'll come across uh, for compositions and the ones that I'm mainly going to focus on for boarding is the rule of thirds. So this is a simple guide to ensure that a pleasing arrangement is made on screen and can aid you in finding great balance for characters. Um, you may have seen this uh, on a number of things. Another thing that the rule of thirds is useful for is making sure that your characters are not too close to the edge of the screen and at risk of getting cut off. You get something that is also called leading lines. And this is basically how your lines are on um, the screen. You know, if you've got a lot of horizontal lines, it can actually create the sense of calmness and sereneness. Um, and these are subtle lines that are happening around your subject and they will indicate to the audience where we need to look on the screen. Another thing you would find is something called the depth of field. And this refers to the kinds of lenses you're using. And even if you're in animation, you can create the sense of a lens from how close or far you are from something or how blurred or clear something is. Um, so this is when you decide how much blur to incorporate into your shot, and you can make elements feel a lot further away or cram super close just by playing with this concept a lot. Okay, the next thing I wanna talk about, about is framing. So if, out of curiosity, who here has been to film school or studied you know, some variation of film theory? You can just unmute and then remute and I'll see who flashes. Okay, so this is going to be new for a lot of you then. Okay, that's excellent. Okay, so now that we've spoken a bit about composition, rule of thirds, um, your, your depth of field and your leading lines, let's talk a bit about your framing. So the framing is um, refers to how you choose to angle the camera within the shot. So unlike the shot size, framing does not care about the proximity to the subject, rather it's about making the shot look good and drive home the emotion that we want the audience to feel. There are a myriad of ways to frame your shot. However, we'll be looking at the very, very basics. So you get a standard shot, and this is like if I turn my camera on. This is me. I'm a standard shot. There's not too much happening here. When we have the two shots, imagine that there's someone standing next to me over there. Um, so that's a two shot when you have two people on screen. Three shot, four shot, five shot. It's literally just showing you how many people are on screen. Over the shoulder shots. Actually, I've got a camera. This is fun. It's like when I'm talking to y'all, did my camera just disconnect? Oh, it did. Oops. Yeah. Damn. No. <laughs> I was getting so excited. I'm like, yay, I can integrate. Okay. Anyway, so over the shoulder it's shots. Like a live, a live camera shot. And this is epic. <laughs> Let me see why is this doing this okay we're back i think let's see okay. yes 
Don't die on me. So, oh, shoulder shot. Ah, oh, okay, it doesn't want to play along. That makes me sad. That would have been so much fun. Um, is literally when, you know, you, you watch a conversation between two people and it's like you're literally hanging over someone's shoulder. So let's just talk about why we use these. The standard shot is placed either in the middle or the third of the screen. No angle to the stand standard shot. It's just, as it implies, straightforward. The two shot frames two prominent or important characters or subjects within the same shot, each element falling into a third. So this is um, really good to frame to opposing forces, and um, you can use it to frame, for example, the war horse uses the two shots a lot when the guy is talking to the horse. So there's two subjects on screen, one's not necessarily human. So it doesn't need to be a person, it just needs to be what's important. Your over-the-shoulder shot, uh, this is used to observe a conversation from just over a character's shoulder, or um, our proximity to the shoulder will affect our level of comfort with the conversation playing out. We'll get into that very soon. I'm excited about that. So we also get something called the Dutch tilt. This is something you see really, really commonly in like thrillers and horrors. And this is when the camera starts like tilting itself at an angle. I'm so tempted to look at the camera, but it's not going to play with me. So now I'm at a Dutch tilt. It's literally something as simple as that. And what it does is it creates visual imbalance and that creates discomfort for the viewer. Um, so these framing choices have the same goal in mind. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, da, 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 I jumped ahead there. The purpose of this framing is almost always to cause unease and a sense of unsteadiness. Um, this is most commonly found in situations of extreme discomfort, fear, and anxiety. You also get something called the worm's eye view um, or the low angle view. And these two framing choices have the same goal in mind. However, one, the worm's eye view is simply more extreme. So the purpose of this kind of framing is to make the subject look grandiose and powerful. Again, think of your camera as a little person. If you are looking up at someone, it tells you, the viewer, that you are physically small compared to whatever you're looking up to. And that could either conjure fearing, uh, feelings of fear or admiration or wonder um, and make whatever you're looking at seem more powerful. Okay, uh, the purpose of this framing is to make the subject look great um, while it makes the character or whoever is the subject of that feel small and powerless, overwhelmed or unimportant. The more extreme you go, then the more the feeling is conveyed. I think this was done really, really well in Ant Bully. Um, I don't know if any of you guys watched that film, but it was literally the ant's point of view of this kid like wrecking their homes. Then you get what's called the bird's eye view, and this is now where you, the camera, are much taller than the subject uh, that you're looking at. And this can either be really, really high up or just a bit taller as if, you know, six foot guy looking on a little beta male. Um, so this show also now puts the viewer um, or the character whose point of view we're navigating through into power. The bird's eye view is used frequently as a means to establish a location as well. So it's not just about power play, but it also helps you figure out where in the story we actually are. Do we have any questions so far? You're good, I'm being clear, right? Yeah, all good from my side. Excellent. Anyone else have any questions? Okay, I'm going to move on. Okay, so now we can actually start seeing what these things are. So let's have a look at shot sizes and what they communicate. So we've got an extreme long shot, um, and that you can see the subject way over there in the distance. So we can't really see anything about them. We can't even see their face. We've got the long shots, and this is where we can see the full person, but they're still at a distance. We've got a medium long shot, and this is generally where they cut off just below the knees, just for a comfortable view. Um, and this is when we're starting to get a little personally closer. We get our mid shots, our medium close up, our close up, our big close up. This is more of an American concept. Uh, we generally use close up, but yeah, big close up is a thing. And then extreme close up. You'll also notice that there is abbreviations, so XLS, LS, MLS, these all give information, and that's what you'll put into the storyboard for the cinematographer, and it just saves you space um, so it doesn't look so incredibly uh, cluttered. Okay, so now that we've had a look at these shots, I've drawn a comparison for what the camera is actually doing. 
So in the first one, we can see the camera is looking down there. It's like a dodgy looking guy. I'm not really sure what they're doing under the bridge, but they look ominous. So it's a safe distance. It establishes where we are um, and it creates a bit of visual intrigue. When we get a bit closer, we're still, uh, you know, at a stranger's comfort level. Uh, also think of your camera as your personal space bubble. How does it make you feel for someone to come in and out of your space bu uh, bubble? You know, family and friends, we have different distances that we're comfortable with. For example, friends, we might um, be comfortable with a hug or, you know, high five. Family, we could possibly get a little closer and then someone you love is right in your face, up close and intimate. So think about the emotional implication that the distance of your camera has on the person uh, that you're framing. The, the next one, the medium long shot, you can see now the camera is actually getting interested. We can see some of the details of the ca uh, character. Um, we now really are interested in the subject. Our next one is the, the, mm, sorry, the medium shot. And this is where we really are getting into a comfortable space bubble. Um, the next one you can see we're now at a, a more friendlier thing. Um, the next one, the, the close-up, is where we're, hey, hi, this is now a friend that we know well. A big close-up, we are now getting really, really too close. And then extreme close-up, the camera is just in the face. So you can either use it to convey important information or create extreme discomfort. Um, for example, if we start with a scene and a man is woken up in bed alone and he looks to the other side of the bed that's empty and he notices on that side of the bed we've cut to an extreme close-up of a wedding ring lying on that side of the bed. What does that tell us? That maybe his wife has just left him. You know, so um, there are functions to the shots. In the same vein, we can use an extreme close-up to make someone incredibly uncomfortable if we show someone like eating, you know. Um, oh, I see the chat here. Ha ha. Okay. I will, I will look at these a little later. Thanks, Chris, for posting the ant bully. Yes, that is an excellent reference. Uh, does the storyboard artist usually choose the angles and shot size? Yes, that is exactly why they've been employed. But again, remember the storyboard artist is not necessarily king. They're there to organize and make um, sense of the chaos. So if you are new to storyboarding, please, please, please consult with cinematographers and people that work with cameras a lot because you can really get a lot more information out of it. Um, I also recommend watch as many films as you can and try to make uh, a study out of what you're watching. Okay, let's touch very briefly on editing. So just before I go a little further, the storyboard artist wears a lot of hats. You're not only the storyboard artist, you're usually the initial character designer. Uh, you'll do a very rough interpretation of how you think the character should work. Uh, it depends on what kind of a production you're on. Sometimes you come with characters designed, sometimes they haven't been done just yet. But usually you need to adapt in a way that you can draw the characters really well and really fast. Uh, usually you're also the, the initial, um, you know, like environment designer because you place the floors and where things are going to be angled. You're a cinematographer, you're an editor, you may even be informing sound design. Um, all of these elements, you know, you really are a jack of all trades. So it's important that you really get to know the different disciplines of film if you're going to get into storyboard seriously. So let's chat about editing. So editing is the arrangement of raw footage, boards and ideas into fluid, seamless sets of sequences that best tell the narrative. This is called shot arrangement. Okay. You also get in editing what is called cutting. So you get a standard cut, and this is just where the footage is boop, cut in the middle. You go from one shot to the next. Um, this is essentially referring to the intelligent, seamless movement between clips. The idea is to transition from one clip to another smoothly without making the movement seem jarring at all. This is the most commonly used cut in video editing. You will see this on news stations, you will see this on Instagram stories, you will see this everywhere. That is the most basic thing to do. You also get what's called an L cut. This is as one shot transitions into another. The audio from the first shot is heard uh, as the scene has already moved to the next um, screen. Um, and the reason it's called an owl cut is because on your editing timeline, the information, you know, um, your, your, your sound is then shifted over. So it actually forms like a little L. That's why it's got the name. 
Same thing happens for the J cut, it's just reversed. So this is when the audience begins to hear audio from the second clip before it begins. I think one of the most common tropes where you see this is like war movies where someone is dreaming about family and then you can hear like gunfire and Captain, you're right. Uh, and then you fade in and you realize you're actually in an active war zone. So that's like an example of a J cut. Um, an example of an L cut would be like you get uh, home renovation shows where we're talking very briefly about the room we're in. And then we can hear the music that is building towards the next shot where we cut to it and someone's like in their new home listening to the radio. Okay, does that make sense? Just like flash your mics if you get it. Cool, cool. Thank you. Okay, so then you also get what's called cross cuts. And this is what you uh, do when you're cutting between two different situations. So both things are happening at the same time but are being played simultaneously in a film. With cross-cutting, you can efficiently uh, narrate several storylines at once, and when done correctly, it completes the story and moves it along seamlessly before the audience. The most common place you'll see this is happening in sitcoms and TV shows. So that's when you introduce something called the A plot, plot B plot, and C plot. Um, and this will be things like, these two main characters have been locked out of their house, what are they going to do? Meantime, these two characters have run out of petrol on the side of the road, what are they going to do? And in the meantime, another set of characters has maybe like ended up on the wrong side of town. And this is where we're going through the different scenarios and we're going back and forth, but it helps keep everything moving. Uh, it would also, you know, make your story a little more interesting because it could be quite boring and disconjointed to sit in, you know, through one entire story, then move to the next and move to the next after that. Um, it could actually be really boring to do that. You also have what's called a jump cut. So these are transitions that uh, are noticeable in an obvious and deliberate way. So this is when clips are in the same, same shot move abruptly to indicate a jump ahead in time. It is also commonly seen in video interviews when an interview is shot uh, with multiple cameras and the different angles are switched between each other. Um, and when basically you just do really, really hard cuts. So you'll see someone who's chatting and then looking down and then a second later their head is snapped up and looking in another direction. So that is what we call a jump cut. Um, most often it's happening because the camera hasn't changed enough uh, of an angle for us to register that it's changed. So it can be jarring and you can use it to really um, make something feel weird and uncomfortable. Uh, another example of jump cuts as a transition for time would be, you know, someone walking through their childhood home and then suddenly it's as if they're a little child in that home again in the same view. So those are kind of what we're alluding to there. You also get what's called the montage. So this is the technique that employs rapid cuts to suggest a large passage of time. I think my all-time favorite is the montage from Up, the first 10 minutes of that film, with no dialogue just showing the story of Ellie and Carl as they like have this wonderful, sad, beautiful life together. And then he ends up alone. It's going to make me cry. I love that film. Um, so unlike a jump cut where there is a single shot um, that is cut into several clips, a montage has several short clips that are put together in a sequence. It's often used to build anticipation and tension in a scene or to give a ton of additional information to whatever is happening. Um, they're a really efficient way to give, you know, a full backstory to a character without needing to actually, you know, sit through their diary. <laughs> Don't mention up. Yes, it's a great film. You also get what's called a match cut. So this is a very creative uh, technique. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the films uh, of Satoshi Kon. This guy is the master of the match cut. So uh, Paprika, um, oh, flip, the names have just flown out of my head now. Um, Perfect Blue, all of his films make use of this as a very stylistic choice. It's what he's most well known for. And this is when the match cut puts together two scenes matching the actions of the first shot, blending it into the subsequent one. It's a stylized way to move a narrative ahead, connecting to otherwise unrelated actions or situations. There's a very famous shot in uh, Tokyo Godfathers from Satoshi Kon's films. And this is where we're watching water drop down a gutter and we follow the drop and then somehow it turns into blood and drips on the floor. And we realize we're now in another situation where someone's just been stabbed uh, and it's so smooth and so clean. It's, it's fantastic. 
Okay, then we get cutaways. So cutaways are, as the scene continues, the viewer is taken away from the subject to be given uh, an idea of the surroundings or by being shown the full scenario in its entirety, the viewer is made aware of the setting of the subject. During this, uh, while the primary scene continues, the focus has been temporarily shifted from the principal subject. So what do I mean by this? Uh, you would get like Jeremy Clarkson on Top Gear, for example, where he is talking about a car and then we'll do intercuts of the stick racing said car around the track. I don't know if you guys remember that show, it was brilliant. But that is basically the whole point of a cutaway. Or you will have advertisements talking about beer and then you'll cut to the um, actual beer being shown. Those are cutaways. It's just giving us additional information shifting our focus or giving us more information um, to look at. Then you get something that is called cutting on action. So using this technique, the scenes are cut right when the action is completed to move to the next shot. And it shows the implication of the first action. So for example, by cutting on action, a scene could be cut while a character is about to give a punch. And then the next scene we would see the punch happening. Okay. So that really just makes the energy of your, your shots move really, really smoothly. Okay, now we're going to talk to something that is called pacing. Um, this is something that really, really, really affects the emotional tone of your films. If you're trying to go for something very sincere and heartfelt, it is very much advisable to use a much slower pace. Um, and when we talk about pacing, it refers to the duration of each shot within a sequence and it affects the emotion of the scene. A slow pace gives the viewer time to calmly observe the situation. It can also be used to call, um, create like intense suspense as we wait anxiously for the next thing to happen. A fast pace is most commonly seen in moments of heightened emotional state, and we often find them uh, during verbal or physical fights, especially in action films. So fast pacing is also used to create a sense of urgency. It could be used to add humor to a sequence as the audience doesn't have time to acclimate to the situation that is rather like forcefully dragged along. So just think of your character moving, uh, your character, your camera moving through the scene um, and how it's going to affect them. So a really good example of slow pacing, again, up, excellent slow pacing for that montage scene, uh, especially the scene that comes directly afterwards, but, you know, um, I actually just realized that's also a match cut where he's sitting on the stairs in the church and then he stands with his balloons and turns and now he's at his house. Beautiful uh, match cut. But because it is so slow, we really have time to sit and settle with his grief, especially because he's saying nothing. He's not doing anything that is um, uh, particularly outrageous. We're just really settling with that sadness. You can also use slow pacing to really mess with people. There's an excellent example in a film called Audition. It's a Japanese film and it's a torture scene. And the pacing is so painfully slow. Again, if you think about how the, the camera is its character, it feels like we're locked in the room with the character uh, during this torture scene. We can't look away. The camera is not moving at all. So we're literally just stuck and it goes on so long. It actually feels really painful. Um, there were a lot of walks out, walkouts in that film, but it is such a top-notch example of good pacing. And then obviously for your Foster stuff, think of things like Foster and the Furious, um, what's his name, Scott Pilgrim versus the world. You know, having these really fast, punchy things happen really gives you a lot of energy. Okay, so now let's talk about acting. Yes, storyboard artists also need to know basic acting. Um, it is also really, really highly recommended that you take time to get to know people get to know how people behave. If you are interested in it, I highly recommend looking into psychology because it will affect how you treat your camera, how your characters react to things. Obviously, so bear in mind, as a storyboard artist, you're there to give as much information as you can, but be careful not to overdo it. You don't want to key out your shots because that is the animator's job. You don't need to do their job for them, but you do need to give key acting information to them. So being a good uh, boarder is knowing some solid basic acting. This can only be really done through observation. Generally, one should think of animation um, as you would a play. So motions tend to be a bit bigger so people in the back can see them. And this is called pantomime. It's an exaggerated form of acting. And we usually see, um, and it is where we usually can step off and explore behavior. 
So be careful, it's very easy to overact a scene. Um, I highly recommend this Acting for Animators by Ted Hooks. It gives so much wonderful uh, information. Uh, my current favorite film ever is Sea Beasts, and it's because it has some of the most phenomenal acting I've seen in a long time. There's some really, really small moments that are just so well done. For example, a character putting down a drink on the table, pouring himself a glass and taking a long time to swirl it around and then having a swig and sniffing, you know. It's, it's such small little additional things to add, but it tells you so much about how this character behaves. Uh, you'll see the same character again later on when, although they're like a really strong, amazing person, um, they're asking for someone to do something for them. And when I watched it, I think by the third time, I noticed at the end of the scene, the character had been holding their breath the whole time. So when they got the answer they wanted, they let out a sigh of relief. And it's such a small human thing to do that it really drives through the reality that you're actually crafting there. So really have a look at activity. It's not all about we need to make the movements work. If you have the time to sit and board um, out smaller actions, really consider doing that. I recommend uh, learning uh, about uh, analyzing body language and it just adds a bit of flair to your work. Okay, and then we just got a little example there of the camera on stage going homeo, homeo, whip all the bro. Okay, so now let's have a look at some useful rules. So when we are working with the storyboards, uh, there are a lot of rules for cinematography and editing. The guard rule in any film is the 180 degree rule. So just out of curiosity before we move on, does anyone know what this rule is? I, I see the thing splashing. Okay, cool. So a few of you do. Basically, yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. That's things. So basically, the 180 degree rule is an imaginary line that runs between two subjects as they speak. And what you do is your camera stays on one side of this 180 degree line. And this is because if you swap that, you end up with a match cut. Um, and it can actually be very jarring and weird to look at. So the easiest way to think of it is, again, remember that your camera is its own character. And if you're sitting in a conversation, you're just going to be swiveling your head back and forth. You're not going to run to the other side of you know, the conversation to see what the person's reaction was and then run all the way back. It's exhausting and it's going to look weird. Okay. The next is screen direction. So. This is also something that's really, really easy to completely forget about, so keep it in mind. Screen direction refers to how we physically move between shots. If a character walks out of a shot, headed screen right, we would expect them to appear in the next shot, screen left, as if they've moved through one solid place. Um, a really good way to think of it is you get really old sitcoms where the camera would literally move through the wall. That is exactly what we're trying to do, is keep that transition nice and smooth by going in one simple direction. Okay, so most often if we're creating for a Western audience, the screen progresses from left to right. However, in some cultures, people read from the opposite direction, so screen progression will actually happen in the opposite way. So also know your audience and who you're creating for, it does have an influence. So this is just an example of screen direction keeping consistent. So you can see I get up, walk down the stairs, come out, and because I've not kept track of my direction, I'm now in a, oh, I forgot the artist's name now. He's gone. But yes, keep, keep notes of where you're moving on screen. This is something that I've only like recently started really forcing myself to incorporate. And I found this has helped me so, 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 so much to really cut out all of the fat and get to the point. And that is to do master takes. So what am I talking about when I do a master take? This is something that live action does constantly, but animation less so. This is uh, when in film it refers to doing an entire scene in one unbroken recording. So for storyboards, this will uh, be a surefire way to identify what is fluff and unnecessary to your scene. Uh, if you first board everything to happen from one cohesive movement, you tend to find more dynamic ways to handle the scene and more um, you know, interesting views that you can get out of it. You'll also realize, okay, maybe I don't actually need to see this character. Yes, empty action, thank you. Uh, you'll realize, okay, I don't need to see this character hang up their codes or 
maybe it would be really cool to swing the camera around. Um, a film that tried to create this effect was, I think, Birdman, um, and was the idea that this entire film was one unbroken edit, although it was just really, really cleverly edited. Um, think of trying to do your boards in one shot like that, and you'll really find fun ways to do things. If you go directly into boarding for each shot, it's a very slippery slope to making way too much stuff that you don't actually need to add um, and don't add to the story, and it just pads out your time. So really be careful of it. I highly advise try doing the master takes first. <laughs> okay, another thing we need to learn about is scene progression. Remember, once again, your camera is the character, and we need to first familiarize ourselves with the world of story, where we are, who we're interacting with. Unless you want to really scare the crap out of us by having us just like jar into place. Again, these are rules, uh, or rather they're the guides, but not necessarily like hard, sure rules. They, they can be bent, but learn them first. So scene progression refers to how we move in and out of a story. Often when we're first being introduced to a story, we'll start with an establishing shot, we'll start cutting closer and closer until we actually get to the subject. So you can see we're, you know, late at night, we see a sort of creepy looking bedroom window. We come into it, we see the bed empty, the doors open. So we follow it to a single light. We come through, we see an open fridge and there's just someone snacking, you know? So this is a smooth bit of scene progression and it just helps us ease into the story. And again, always remember what your camera is up to. Uh, it's a psychological trick of creating interest. Um, so by slowly introducing us, again, that's how you sort of manipulate the audience into wanting to see what comes next. By showing your hand too fast, it could be a bit boring or jarring. Um, and by doing it too slow, you can actually also bore your, your audience. So try and figure out your mid-ground. Best way to do that is to show it to other people, get an idea of their sense of pacing. Uh, it seems that the like, general rule is if you're going for a well-paced thing no no less than three seconds per you know location or where you are uh, if you're doing it shorter than that then people miss vital information so three seconds is like the sweet shot for any um intercuts or basic basic shot a good way to figure out scene progression is to turn it into what's called a Q&A so if we go back here I want to go back one second there we go Turn it into a Q&A. Question, where are we? We're outside, it's night. Okay, that's our answer. This is gonna lead us to the next question. What are we looking at? It's a bedroom window, okay? What's in the bedroom window? A bedroom, oh wow. Uh, what else do we see? An open door. What's through the open door? You see how it starts to actually make you want to learn more? That's because you're creating a visual Q&A. Okay, so set up the question, lead us to the answer and set it up for the next question. So we're eager to see what comes next. The next thing is to know who to focus on and what to focus on. A very common rule is to make the most important thing uh, on screen the biggest, and this was by Kubrick, um, but it also helps to know where to pull focus. Focus is an incredibly um, clever tool to really show us where we're supposed to be looking. So you can see I've got the same couple fighting over a bit of cake and various scenarios happening with the cake just based on where I'm putting the main focus. So in this frame over here, the main focus is on the most contrasted part of the screen. Contrast creates interest, and we tend to look at either the brightest or the um, most bold thing on screen first. This is a very standard view. We can see exactly what's happening. In this view, we see there's a third person that's either eating the cake or thinking of eating the cake. And in this one, we've shifted the interest entirely to something that's happening in the background. Okay, and again, we're coming back to cinematic language, as I touched on before. It refers to a selection of shot sizes, framing techniques, and shot angles you use throughout your film. Think of it as creating a PowerPoint presentation. Yes, there's lots of cool fonts, but too many create visual chaos. Narrow things down and stick to it. Breaks you away uh, and break away from it only when it's absolutely needed. This ties back to your genre as well, so take that into consideration. It may even tie into your own personal um, style. Uh, what's his name now? The Fantastic Fox, uh, I think the, the Grand Budapest Hotel. I always forget his name for some reason. What is he? 
Wes Anderson. Wes Anderson. Yes, Wes Anderson. <laughs> he is so well known for having everything perfectly balanced on scene um, while having everything really, really miniaturized. And it's just like cutting extremely between these epic shots to really ridiculous, up close, uncomfortable angles. Um, stylistically, I don't know if you guys have seen the show um, from the BBC called Peep Show. And um, this is an entire sitcom about two friends that aren't necessarily on the best footing, but it is literally shot in point of view and you can hear the internal dialogue and it is, you die of secondhand embarrassment on that show. It is so, so fantastically done. So also think about your cinema, uh, your, you know, your cinematic language from the perspective of what you want to accomplish from this. Okay, this is where I see people burn out and die. Storyboarding is not about drawing well. You don't need to be a good artist to be a good storyboard artist, and I cannot express this enough. A lot of people I've seen who've got really good tastes and sensibilities thought, oh no, I can't do storyboarding because I can't draw. That's rubbish. It is about using shorthand and being sensible. It is a technical document. You're not doing an art piece. So when I talk about shorthand, this refers to how much you simplify a drawing in order to save yourself time and explore more options. By ignoring overly detailed characters, you can really focus on the core elements of your storyboard. Remember, detail does not dictate quality. Efficiency does. So you can see that we've got a little example here, a really detailed character. If you're on a tight deadline and you have to draw like 400 more frames of this character, that's going to be horrible. Instead, we've got the same character, but in shorthand. And this gives enough visual information about us, uh, the character to be, you know, recognizable. You know, we've got the roller blades, we've got the large eyes, the bean body and the bun. That tells us all we need to know. We get the idea of the character from that. Another thing you can do to really save yourself time is make use of the target and ball method. So you can see over here, I've just got a ball that I've drawn a target on, and you can actually tell exactly where the eyes are supposedly going. This is pointing downwards, we've got eyes looking up, this is looking extremely down, and this is staring directly at us. You can then push that even further by adding a color code if you need to save yourself time. Um, so you can see the full emotion of this interaction without any expressions actually needed here. So it's a really effective one. I highly recommend using this when you're doing your um, thumbnailing as well. Um, and then once you're more comfortable one with your like character silhouettes, you can move into something a little more refined. Um, so make sure you've got clear expressions um, for your you know mid close-ups. Uh, it's really important that you get the full eye in. So avoid these dotted eyes because the problem with them is it's very easy to confuse where your character is looking. So you can see if I just complete the circle on the same drawing, the character could be looking in either direction and that can cause a lot of confusion. If your character is extremely far away and not that important, yeah, fine. But if it is something going on and we want to see their reactions, make sure that your eyes are very clear. Another thing to talk about is grids. So if you can't draw a background, that's not a problem. Again, you don't need to be a fantastic artist to be a storyboard artist. What you can then do instead is to suggest your depth of the scene effectively by making use of grids. It will help you to study perspective um, and it will really, really help you to um, sort of ground your camera and your characters. So you can suggest the depth of the scene effectively through the use of grids. You will, however, need to understand perspective. I highly recommend learning a bit more about it. Grids can be placed to ground the characters and save time drawing and give us an accurate sense of scale to the shot. So I've got like two characters here in a ball and we're just going to place various grids and see how it affects our perception of this. So you can see if we've got um, the grid flat down, the camera is like at a really lower angle to the ground, we can now see that there's actually a size difference and maybe that's the sun. If we have the grid straight on, this could be a picnic if we have a slightly, um, you know, angled grid, it gives us a sense that these characters are standing slightly apart. Mm -hmm. I haven't changed anything about the drawings, mm -hmm. but the grids have given us all that information. And we don't have to draw backgrounds, it makes enough sense. Okay. So as you can see, the grid entirely recontextualizes the drawing. Making use of them will elevate your level of professionalism uh, substantially, and it will get you used to working with environments as well. Yes, I have seen the storyboards. They are absolutely fantastic. Okay, 
So another thing that's really important, this is also something that I've been recently incorporating things, and this is something that's called eye trace. So this just helps you cut smoother, and this is especially when you're cutting closer or further away from a character. Um, this is a note one doesn't typically hear about. So eye trace is ensuring that when you cut to the next shot, especially if the shot scales up or down, um, that wherever you place the character or the object of interest last is similarly arranged. So one of the quickest ways to make the film unenjoyable is to force your audience to do a lot of work by looking around at things. Um, and it actually wastes time. It mentally tires you out. So you can see this character's head is sort of in the same position in the next shot. So it's easy to like make contact on where his eyes should be. If we cut to the next shot and he's over here, now we're going to have to like totally switch around and it just changes the viewing experience. It's a subtle thing, but it does make a difference. Okay, and now we're nearing the end of our session. This is the last uh, section that I'm going to talk about. Um, and this is common mistakes and how to avoid them. The most frequent thing I see with new storyboard artists is repetitive framing. And this is something I notice immediately with new boarders and it's a lack of visual rhythm and variation in a scene. People tend to play it really safe and repeat a composition that works. Most often they censor their subject too much or make use of excesses, uh, excessive over the shoulder shots. So you can see in almost every single thing, the character is arranged in the center here. So this is a little scenario, it's like, hi, hey there, what you got there? Uh, can I see it? Uh, and then she just sort of walks away. Now, if we change up and we play with our camera angles a little more, we can get more information and more humor out of this. So we go, hi there, hey, what you got there? Uh, weird porn stuff she's drawn. Uh, can I see it? Uh, run away. Immediately, this feels a lot more interesting. We've got a lot more variation to look at. And because we've now added this thing of changing our angles, coming in closer where we need to, we've now actually added a bit of humor to it. So this is basically the best example of cinematic language that I can give to you guys. Um, yeah, that's how it works. So first identify the question and answer in the scene. So in those first three shots, it's where are we? We're likely in a school or a university. Um, and what are we doing? Is the characters inquiring about whatever the other person's holding? Once you have that, act it out in your head and see if you can find a more interesting way to bring us to that conclusion. Lastly, discard all of your first, second, third, fourth, fifth ideas, because those are the obvious ideas. Everyone's going to choose those. Um, I, I, who was it that I was speaking with? Basically, their, their script writing process was you write five scripts and then you burn them um, because of the, those are the bad ideas. Get all the bad ideas out first and then really start playing around. Okay. Another thing I tend to see a lot is too much negative space on the screen. And this refers to the part of the screen that's not really being used for any given purpose. Yes, you can use a really extreme wide angle to establish where we are. But again, consider where we're focusing and what the importance is. If you've just got like a superhero here and a ton of like empty space, this character doesn't feel powerful and it's really boring to look at. And it's kind of awkward. It's like, you know, a toddler got hold of the camera. Um, so negative space refers to the part of the screens. Oh, wait, no, I've said that, sorry. To avoid this, reconsider what you want to show here and where our focus needs to be. The safest option tends to be placing a character in the thirds and giving the focal point to the largest part of the screen. So this char character over here is more in the thirds, not quite just yet, but you can see that they break a visual rhythm and because we are close enough, it's a comfortable view. This is a big one. This is something I still talk about because it scarred me for life. Um, just a little backstory. I studied at AFTA in Johannesburg. And part of studying there is um, your graduation films actually get screened at a cinema. Um, and what I didn't consider when I'm making the film is that the aspect ratio of a cinema screen is very different from the screens we were working with at university. And our lecturer had warned us about this, but I got really caught up. So pay attention to your letterbox. This is the little bar that appears around your camera view and this shows you where the corners um, and the edges of your screen are. Um, it's easy to get carried away in the art of things, but ensure your aspect ratio is correct before you begin um, and that you've given care not to go too far out of the letter or bounding box of your scene. 
because what ended up happening is you can see I'm drawing a really sincere expression there. And then when we got to see it in the cinema, we were just staring at people's necks literally the entire film. It was very confusing for the entire audience. It was a horrible experience. Learn from me, please. Okay. <laughs> it's not a stylistic choice. <laughs> so the 180 degree rule breaks. Again, it's very easy to break this rule, but the best way to avoid it is to first block your shots out by using a floor plan. That is this little thing over here where we can see our subjects and where our camera can move. You can safely break this rule by intercutting to an insert or moving closer to favoring, uh, moving closer to or favoring a character until they're more or less centered on screen. So remember, it should ideally feel like a conversation with you standing in between or next to a subject. Another thing one will often see is people who lose track of continuity. Remember what I said in the beginning, when you are making your notes, you need to take note of how many characters there are, any key props, time of day, how many scenes we've got. And this is because it will affect your continuity. Um, I've seen that again, coming back to CBs, there's a massive continuity issue uh, in one of the first sequences where they're fighting uh, a beast there, where a character is on screen um, running to go and get a weapon. And he's been on the ship the entire time. He's perfectly dry. And in the very next shot, this character is soaking wet. He hasn't fallen in the water, nothing. He's just suddenly wet for some reason. So even on big budget stuff, it happens. So try your best to keep track of everything. So continuity refers to inconsistencies throughout a scene or a film. It commonly happens where even if a uh, border forgets what the character should be wearing, what they were handling, or even where they were situated. There's a lot to keep track of, so ensure you frequently flip through your boards to make sure that you've gotten everything down. Keep track of assets, screen direction, action, and your character's positions between shots. Okay, another thing, and this is a mistake that I'm still guilty of to these days, so really it is something you will just have to learn. It is a painful one to learn, but try it. Do not fall in love with your boards. Uh, it's good, but remember, it isn't about illustration. It's about telling the story. You are there to do a job, and that is your job. Try to allocate only a certain amount of time when boarding to ensure that you have your script uh, nearby and ready um, to reference and see what else needs to get done. It's a dangerous trap to get too carried away and get off topic. This happened on the film that I was revising earlier this year. Basically, I had to take a 20-minute film and cut it down to a 10-minute film by keeping the pacing the same, and all of the information consistent. And although that might not sound very difficult, it was one of the hardest things I've had to do. Um, and I had a number of times where I found myself struggling and I would do a really wonderfully rendered shot. I'd bring it to the client and I'd say, okay, can I see the other options? And I'd literally spent all of my time making that shot pretty, but I hadn't drawn other options. And that is a big no-no. You need to give your directors and your writers options so that they can really navigate what they want out of the story. Okay, another thing, do not, please do not, millions of arrows are pure laziness. Uh, if you need a hundred arrows to indicate a movement, I promise it will be easier for you to just redraw the movement. Uh, easy rule is to use uh, or break your shot into smaller actions, a beginning, a middle, and an end. So someone that needs a drink, You'll have them in the first beat, look at the drink. Second beat, they're reaching out for the drink. And then the third, they're now drinking the drink. Very clear, simple. We now understand what's happening there. Um, I have seen it quite a few times where someone's drawing an arrow to indicate which direction the camera's moving in, while drawing an arrow to tell us where the character is looking, and another arrow to tell us that someone else is walking in the opposite direction. I was like, what, what information am I supposed to get from this? It is really confusing. Okay, and um, that is it. So to conclude, storyboards are really hard, so start practicing now. Um, I've included some little uh, handy dandy links. So the main one I really recommend having a look at is Thomas Romain's uh, Perspective Notes. And this man breaks down how to do environments so, so amazingly. It will make your life so easy. Even if you're not a storyboard artist, if you're interested in environments um, and animation, this is the guy to learn from. And then you can learn a bit more about composition for film over here. And that is it. Um, yeah. Epic. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Jeannie, for giving us that amazing masterclass. And um, 
I'm currently doing load shaded, so I'm, I'm just kind of doing this from my phone. So I hope that uh, my audio is still coming through fine. But yeah, if everyone can just get, uh, yeah, I don't know how to do a round of applauses on Discord <laughs> like this, but imagine imagine everyone clapping right now. Um, there we go. We've got people spamming the chat. That's amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks, Jeannie. It, it, it really was a, a masterclass. Like, um, so much to learn. I would really love to, to take a look through these, um, this presentation again and just kind of dissect it even more. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I, Special I, shout out. I and, and, and thanks. You guys. Yeah, wonderful. I mean, I think um, is yeah, yeah. Please go for it. Um, Jeannie, do you think uh, most sorry about artists are like self-taught? Cause like, or do they like learn from like experience? I mean, learning from self uh, experience is sort of like self-taught. But I think yes. Uh, I think you need to live your own experiences to figure out how you can handle things. A lot of storyboard artists get hired for how they treat things. Um, but yeah, you, you will always be learning. So I guess you are essentially self-taught. When I was in the university, I think we only spent like a week on storyboards. And then I began, you know, went into a studio directly afterwards as a storyboard artist. Um, and I had to learn by fire. So I think that is the reality for a lot of people here. Uh, I think in South Africa now, we're actually starting to sort of bridge that gap a little bit. I know Triggerfish has built out an amazing course at the moment with live mentorship um, for storyboarding. Um, so it, I guess it really depends. Like, guys, curate a community that you can share and learn from, and then maybe it won't be so difficult for you. Thank you. Next, um, I do just want to um, bring everyone's attention to a really cool event that's happening on the 20th of October. Um, I'm just putting it in the in the chat here, and that's the Motion Design Meetup in Cape Town. So I know a lot of a lot of everyone here is, is not from Cape Town, but um, if you are in Cape Town, we're going to be meeting up at the waterfront at, at Workshop 17. Um, and Nicholas Ritt and Keegan McPherson are going to be giving some talks and live illustration demos. Um, so please, if you are in Cape Town or if you want to fly down to Cape Town, come check it out. It's going to be an amazing event, in-person event. So you can come meet, meet like-minded people and meet other motion designers. Um, so, um, yeah, I just want to give a shout out. And then, yeah, the thank you, Jeannie, for, for an amazing, um, your station and, and where can we find you? Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about your community and where can we find you online? Oh, sure. So you can uh, find me on SADAC. So that is the Discord server that I run. And it is just a community of like minded artists who want to learn and grow from each other. I really want to, you know, create a space that allows people to network and find. Uh, people that they can work with or post work and just really make a space that people can help each other out because you know this industry is really hard work and it is hard to do alone um so i'd really like to see that sort of booted so you can find us on the south african digital arts community uh, i will ask or i will post a link to our server um, and there's going to be some exciting eventing coming up there soon including quite a lot of storyboarding that will be happening I've got some fun announcements coming up there, so do stay tuned if you'd like to learn more. And we have a lot of guest speakers over there. Richard actually gave a motion design introduction there yesterday. I'm in conversation with someone who's going to be giving us an intellectual property discussion on how to actually, you know, monetize and protect your information and your creations as an artist and an animator. We just need to confirm dates there. Um, and then we've also received confirmation from Tina van der Royen, who is going to be teaching us a bit about gesture and anatomy at some point soon. So there are some exciting things in the works. If you want to find us there, that is where we are. You can also find me on Instagram. Uh, my handle is at animated, the number four, and then you, Y O U. Um, and I just post general stuff every now and then. Uh, unfortunately, I don't ever really post my storyboards on that because everything I do is under NDA, which sucks. Um, but yeah, I hope to see you guys there.